Welcome to Vets to PM's Military Transition Academy podcast, the show where we discuss how to succeed in transitioning from the military service to the civilian workforce. This show and the academy it represents helps veterans transition into meaningful, lucrative post-service careers. Your primary host is Eric Doc Wright, PhD, certified manager, military veteran, serial founder, best-selling business author, philosopher, linguist, and coach. Your other host is Jeremy Burdick, project management professional, scrum master, product owner, and retired Air Force chief, and the current COO of Vets to PM and the Professional Development Unit University, where we will interview veterans successful in corporate America and business to bring you nuggets of wisdom every episode to make you more successful. Next, let's introduce today's guest. Our special guest today is Anna Reese Ricker, and she works for a company called 4840 Solutions. Uh, she's the recruiting manager for them, and she originally came from Mexico City in 2013. She started in sales. She's people-oriented and loves to help others. Uh, she transitioned from sales to recruiting about seven years ago, and She's used to fast-paced, high-volume recruiting, training, and developing recruiting teams. She started this role in October of 2021 for 4840 Solutions, one of the fastest-growing pallet-making uh, companies and logistic companies in America and probably the world, which has really been exciting and fun for her and also challenging. She loves her company's mission, their culture, the team, and the direction they're taking it, and once you hear this, you're going to really understand how veteran friendly this organization is because they built veteran values from the top all the way to the bottom. Um, I cannot express enough that I didn't even wasn't even aware of this organization or um, this commodity of pallets, but I realized it's it's an own its own ecosystem and it's got opportunities for just about anyone looking to get into business. So listen up. She's got a lot to say about what your resume should contain in it, what you should and shouldn't say during an interview. I can't wait to see how many people like this episode. Hey, welcome back, everybody listening and watching out there in MTA Podcast Nation. We are so excited to have you back for another episode. Uh, as always, I'm accompanied by the most handsomest sidekick in the entire podcast business, uh, and actually, he tells folks I'm his sidekick, and since uh, he I, I let it, he lets me do it because I'm taller. But other than that, I'm the sidekick. So, JB, what's going on there, man? Not much, not much. Excited to uh, do this show. I think we've got a pretty cool uh, guest today, and I I think you guys are going to learn something. It's so interesting when we get to talk to uh, civilian recruiters and hiring managers and get kind of inside their insight, so that we can pass that along to you know, the audience here. So without further ado, Anna, tell us a little bit about uh, your company. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so about 4840 Solutions, we are the largest and fastest growing pallet management company in the U.S. Uh, we provide uh, pallet management services, um, off-sites, reverse logistics services. Uh, we have plants all over the U.S. Collectively, we have over 200 locations private fleets, and we support major retailers in their pallet management and recycling needs. Wow. Wow. How many employees is that? Right now we are at about 6,000 and we are scheduled to be at 8,000 in the next two to three years. So we're going through acquisitions, which is uh, very exciting for us. We're expanding our operations, our client base, uh, base and, um, and yeah, we're, we're expanding our team. See, and for, for, you know, those of you that uh, listening and watching, I mean, some of you may know uh, VSPM, we've got a pretty revolutionary uh, Department of Defense approved skill bridge program. Um, it's basically an accession pipeline, right? You come out of DOD, uh, you can be a human resources manager, a project manager, an operations manager, uh, a cybersecurity manager. So one of the cool things about our relationship with Anna um, and her company is, they love vets. They love hiring vets. And as you just heard, I mean, look at the diversity of that, right? Did you even know there was such a thing as a pallet management industry? But there is one and they're expanding and growing the number one company in America. So what a cool environment for vets that say, hey, I ran this shop. I ran this department. I was the superintendent. I was the you know, platoon sergeant. Hey, I want to come out and be operations management. 
So Anna, tell us about some diversity of positions and roles and things that, that you really, uh, some opportunities that you got, and then we'll ask you about skill sets and, and uh, stuff that you look for. Of course. So we have, um, well, first we found that military members are great in our business because of supply chain and logistics, right? The military can set up shop in three days in a completely different country. So when it comes to logistics, you have it down packed. So uh, we have positions, uh, project management um, positions that we're working currently with SkillBridge. Um, we have uh, intern, um, anal data analysts, interns, project management interns. Um, we have assistant plant managers. So in our, on our operations side, uh, we, are, um, we have uh, assistant plant managers, individuals that will learn the operation of the plant uh, for someone who's interested in hands-on um, and wants to be active in the operation side. Um, and warehouse management. So um, those are, I would say, the four um, the four positions that we currently have available for uh, for um, DoD interns. Wow, that's great. That's great, and it's pretty diverse. I mean, if you didn't catch that, that was quite a few different style positions. So you likely fit into one of them. Yep. Uh, if you're ever wondering, and what I heard was. Uh, 6,000 to 8,000. I mean, that's amazing. So you're going to grow by 2,000 uh, folks. That's a huge percentage increase for any company. And you definitely want to seed it with some of the best talent and responsible, organized people. What, in your opinion, makes um, the veteran more successful in your company uh, in particular? So veterans, the military teaches you a lot of skills, but the main skills that apply to our industry, the first thing is leadership. Military members are great leaders because the military forces you to become a great leader. Uh, the, you know, most people are not, don't know, most people in management don't have leadership skills just because you're a manager does not mean that you're a leader, but military veterans are great leaders. They, they lead by example, they lead from the front, they're very hands-on. And as leaders, they provide the right training to their team because they know that by your team being trained properly and given the right tools, you are being set up for success. So knowing those or having those leadership skills and knowing how to train a team, not only how to manage a team, but how to train a team, how to develop a team and how to make sure that every member of your team is qualified to do the task and really take care of it. Um, that's, that's, I think that's the biggest, if I had to pinpoint a quality that's veterans have the biggest quality is leadership um military members veterans are are team oriented they know that your team is only as strong as your weakest link so you want to make sure that everybody is qualified so going back to uh leadership you you want to make sure that everybody can do everybody's job because you need to your life depends on it <laughs> so when uh you want to make sure that everybody is um everybody's working together because we're working towards a common goal so they're great team players and lastly they're they're goal oriented so the, the military teaches you how to be goal oriented how to be determined and how to find a solution how to you know you're going to run into situations and some in the military those situations can be life or death situations luckily in our company they're not but we still need to be able to operate always be in solution mode i'm encountering this problem what am i going to do how do i fix it so the military really gives you the tools to be able to to think that way think critically and, and find a solution and work towards that goal so that is why you know veterans in our industry are so successful anywhere from management operations management all, all the way to our uh, c-level executives we have so many veterans and military members from everything the navy um air force the uh the marines it's it's so diverse and they are our best players Wow. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, so uh, Anna, you really hit on it. I mean, so very few, so civilian managers in general, right? So we do all the planning and the metrics and the norms and the behaviors and identify the environment that our people are going to operate. That's our planning function. And then we do the uh, organizing resources function for our people, secure the resources to do operations or projects or whatever. Then we lead as managers and then we control, we keep performance on plan to hit the metrics. So managers have experience doing all four things. Military leaders have experience doing all four things, even though we walk around and just call ourselves leaders, right? But what Anna just highlighted is, and you all know this uh, out there in MTA Podcast Nation, military members 
learn leadership OJT style. Like we don't read a book. We don't go to seminars and webinars for the weekend, whatever. Like you go to school for it. They teach it to you. Then they put you in a billet and then you lead for 18, 24, 36 months or you don't. And then you don't go to the next billet or you do. You go to the next schoolhouse to get ready for the next position. So you heard Anna Key on that, right? So, but the cool thing is, is they've got a management program that Anna, I want you to tell us about, but you know, that way our military members get in there and they may say, yeah, but Eric, I've never managed this, a budget in the civilian workforce, or I've never managed a training plan. Uh, you heard her talking about training her people. No, but you've managed, you've led people and you've managed things. And, you know, maybe it was boxes, MREs, maybe it was arms in the armory. Maybe it was quartz oil in the motor pool. You've got management experience. So Anna, tell us about your management program that these guys and gals can go into. Sure. So I just want to reiterate the pallet management industry, as you mentioned, isn't something that is known to many people. Before I started working in the company, I didn't know there was so much money in pallet. So the, the trade itself is something that you can learn. So what you what is harder to teach or what is harder to learn is that management style. So or the management and the successful management is what is what's difficult to learn um, or what is not as easily found. Right. So what we want is to put the right person in the right place because the, the right person means the one that already has a leadership qualities is already solution oriented, is already goal oriented by nature or because they've been put in those situations through the military. Um, we'll teach everything else. So for example, just take an example, our assistant plant management um, training. So that one we call the plant management training role. Um, that one will start off with the basic uh, entry level roles, which is the saw shop operator. So uh, to give you a little bit of insight, our production line inside the plants is quite simple. We have trailers coming in full of pallets that need to be repaired. So they go into the repair line, the pallet repairs repair the pallets, they stack them up, load them back into the trailer. Or if they're not repairable, then they take, get taken apart. So we can save some parts to put it into other pallets or we can, um, we can grind them if they're non salvageable right? Uh, we can grind them, turn them into molds. But um, the production line is quite simple. We have forklift operators, we have saw shop operators, uh, we have pallet repairmen. Um, they are the, the assistant plant manager or the plant manager in training will learn all those. They'll learn how to operate a forklift. They'll learn how to uh, operate the saw shop. Uh, they'll learn how to, um, how to repair the pallets and how to use the nail guns. They'll learn how to stack the pallets up and load the trailers and unload the trailer. So the first they'll start learning the basics. They'll get OSHA certified. They'll make sure that, the, that they understand um, safety and enforce safety standards. So they'll learn from the very nitty gritty, everything about each position. From then on, they're, uh, they're, they learn about um, the budgeting side. They'll learn about how do we make money? So the, what customers we work with, what are our profit margins? They'll learn all of that and how the operation works. They'll also learn the HR side. So interviewing candidates, onboarding them, going through the, the, the hiring process. Um, they'll learn employee relations, how to have a difficult conversation with an employee, how to, uh, how to, how to um, yeah, how to have a difficult conversation when an employee is not performing or when they've missed two days in a row or, you know, whatever uh, the situation is. Um, but part of the, what the military already teaches you is how to have those, those conversations with people. So um, they'll be able to deal hands-on with what that looks like in the civilian life. Um, they'll learn how to terminate an employee. They'll learn how to run payroll. Um, then they'll learn the, uh, the supervisor role. So budgeting, how to uh, do KPI measurements, reports, uh, budget reports, inventory, um, and they'll work with every single position under them to be able to understand fully how the operation works and how each role aligns to, to, to enable the operation to be successful. Uh, once they're trained, then they can assist the plant manager and, and help run the operation. So literally learning the business from the front line up seeing the entire value supply chain, manufacturing, sustainable recycling, like the whole thing, managing personnel in every function. And then, oh, by the way, gang, remember what Anna said at the top of the show. Hey, we're growing like a prairie fire. You know what I mean? So guess what they do with the brand new, freshly trained manager, probably. I don't know, send them to a new shop, like to go run that place. I mean, what a very cool opportunity. So I mean, JB, what did you think about that, dude? Did you oh, even man. have any idea, bro? 
No, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have a cool, I'll tell you what stands out to me. And, I, and this is probably a testament to what a cool company it is. And then I want to get back to pallet management as a, like, as a service, because I'm not aware. But what I really, what stood out is that you take the time to do some of those things that you value from veterans, like ensuring your people are trained is one of the biggest oversights that companies uh, likely have because they just like, we'll just go do it. You were hired to do it. You said you could do it on this resume, go do it. But how do you do it? Like, how do you want me to do it for you to meet your strategic goal? So the, the onus is kind of on that company to make sure that we know how to serve the way you want us to serve. Um, I don't know a veteran around that if you tell them what they you want out of them, that they won't do it. It's the, when they're left to their own devices and you're like, hey, I don't know what to do. I, I know I'm supposed to be here at eight o'clock in the morning, but you know, it's just complete wasted time. So I really, I mean, that's what stood out to me. It's you first, you learn to run the nail gun, right? I mean, that's, that's important. You've got to know what's going on on your floor. Uh, you run the forklift, you, you, lots of safety and OSHA things going on there. And then you go all the way to payroll. I mean, and, and termination, I mean, I loved it. I really thought you, uh, whoever came up with that program is, uh, needs a pat on the back and it's probably you. I mean, I don't know, <laughs> it's, but, it's, but it's a really, really cool uh, and it mimics what you get in the military. Yeah, I have to, I have to give credit to our executive um, VP <laughs> and to our uh, that might be one of your veterans, right? I mean, because it, it gets very similar. You bring them into basic training, tell them how to, you know, uh, tie their boots and shine them up. And then you get them to the next advanced uh, specialization training. And then, you know, from there, it's leadership, leadership, leadership over and over and take care of your folks. And that's really kind of sounds like what you're doing. How cool. Back to this, like, pallet management. So what are some of the other services that 4840 um, basically provides? So we provide reverse logistics. Um, we do on-site and off-site support for our retail customers um, and recycling as well. So uh, just to put it in perspective, if you go to a Kroger or Walmart and you see the plastic bins that are um, that display the fruits and veggies, those come from us. Um, and yeah, we, we assist with those. Uh, the cardboard boxes that display produce or products, those as well. Uh, and pallets, if you, we work with pretty big companies. Um, Costco, Amazon, Target, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, Ace Hardware, uh, CVS, Best Buy, you name it. So aside from pallet management um, or aside from uh, the um, providing pallets, custom making pallets, buying, selling, recycling, um, we also provide them with reverse logistics um, services on site and off site and uh, retail recycling services. Wow. Wow. A pretty what big a industry. Great, what, a great, <laughs> what a great diversity of revenue streams and business lines. And I mean, you know, uh, what, a, what a, a testament to 4840. That's pretty neat. Pretty neat. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I think it's smart to have a couple different product lines. You know, I, I just, I, I got this visual in my head of like stacked pallets. I drive, when I drive, I see this, there's a place that does um, like trailers and they mm -hmm. just, they're all, they, I think they don't know what to do with these pallets. <laughs> like, yeah. Like they should recycle them or give them back to you guys or something, but it's, they seemingly just stack them and they're just, they're probably a 150 feet high and it's nothing but a line of pallets. And I'm thinking to myself, man, somebody created those. Somebody put those in the, in the, uh, in the world somewhere and they probably are, you know, need those to go do something else. And I, I know in the military, we would, uh, we would move aircraft full of pallets because everything needed them. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, there was a time I ran I probably 20 missions in a row where it was nothing but me pre-staging pallets. And I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we also uh, provide supply retrieval. So some companies, for example, Walmart would just leave them outside and we go, our trailers uh, pick them up and we bring them back and do the same thing, recycle them, repair them, um, turn them into mulch if we can't do anything with them. Um, sell that back to Home Depot or, or Walmart. That's amazing. So everything gets used. We're pretty environmental, environment friendly. Every single piece of wood gets used. Everything, plastic gets recycled, cardboard gets recycled. Wow. So Anna, considering your knowledge of just the entire business, which is impressive, by the way, um, what are some, what are two or three 
really great things or things that a veteran could learn about or to ask questions about in an interview that would make you or the other 4840 hiring managers go, hey, this cat did some good research, right? They're showing engagement. And then <laughs> what are the, because we're going to leave the names off all of this so nobody can be proven innocent nor guilty. What are some of the two or three things that are just not topics that somebody should ask about in that first or second interview? Because see, here's one thing that they don't know. When you say, hey, get ready for your interview. Well, some veterans I know have never had an interview. Maybe Home Depot, maybe Mickey D's before service. But I mean, for some of them, even if they had formal interviews, it was maybe eight years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago. You know, when I got out, they said, hey, do a resume. Hey, use LinkedIn. Nah, never mind. Al Gore still inventing the internet. It's like 1994. There was no such thing as internet, Facebook, <laughs> any of that stuff. So, so what are some two or three things that they could ask questions about or really knock out of the park? And what are two or three things that, hey, maybe you know, they shouldn't kind of talk about maybe the first interview, right? Because they okay. don't know these things. Sure. Yeah. So for uh, my tips for a person that's going to interview, um, the first thing is make sure that your resume pinpoints your achievements in these positions, right? So if you are, if you were a logistics manager, okay, well, what were your accomplishments as a logistics manager? What were some of your responsibilities? But more than your responsibilities, what were some of your accomplishments? Um, when, you, when you're building your resume, make sure that you are using the keywords that the job description is, 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 um, is requiring. So if they say these are the requirements or we're looking for somebody with experience in supply chain or with some experience in management, talk about that in your skills. Make sure that when you're putting your resume together, you in your skills, you mentioned you, you have to mention your skills. A lot of people leave that off and they just say objective. Well, we don't all know what your, obje your objective is fine job, <laughs> which is why you're, you're putting this application out there, right? So put your skills. What skills are you familiar with? What are you confident? What, what are you good at? Make sure that's the first thing that is in your resume and in your descriptions, in your, um, in your experience um, description, put what some of your accomplishments were rather than just the responsibilities, because that's really what we want to look at. When I look at a resume, I'm comparing the skills for if I need a financial analyst that needs X, Y, Z, I'm looking at this person's skills. Do they have experience as an analyst? Do they have um, experience with Excel? Do they have experience? The things that resonate, right? The things that are the same with the description then uh, as well as the, the candidate's resume. And if they have it, great, moving forward. If they don't mention that, not even going to move forward, um, moving on to the next one. So always make sure that in your resume, put your skills, what are you good at? And, and your organizational skills, time management skills, the, the skills that the military teaches you that you are, that, that you otherwise don't necessarily learn. So communication, leadership, time management, solution oriented, those skills, um, and in the descriptions, make sure that you emphasize what your accomplishments have been. Um, when you're asking questions to the interviewer, ask them, what are the expectations for somebody in this position? What does a recruiter expect or what does a company expect from the candidate? What are the, ex what's expected from this person? Ask them what the ideal candidate would be like, because that's, you, you want to be the ideal candidate, right? Or maybe you realize that their ideal candidate is not really what you're looking for. If they say the ideal candidate is someone that will be, um, I don't know, be available at midnight to answer phone calls, but maybe that's not what I'm looking at. But the ideal candidate will be solution oriented. They will be a quick learner. They'll be X, Y, Z. You know what they're looking for, which means that you can talk about the things that they are looking for. So another big tip that I can give individuals when um, interviewing is, talk about your accomplishments. You are selling yourself to this individual. You are selling yourself to this company. Why should this company invest in you and your training? Why should we invest in your development? Because when we bring somebody on board and most companies operate this way and if they don't, they should. We bring somebody on board that has some of the experience, but industry is something that you're gonna learn which, with each position. So if you are, um, if you talk about what you've accomplished, if you talk about, if you're selling yourself, you can, um, you can show the company, are you a good investment? They're going to invest time, tools, and money in your training. So are you a good investment? Talk about how you will be a good investment of their time, how you are, how, how they're making the right decision, what you can bring to the table. So I'll emphasize a lot on that. Um, 
And the things that I would say um, avoid is talking talking about what you're um, what you or saying that you know something that you don't. Um, eventually, people will figure it out. I think it's it's really important to be yourself. Be yourself with the interviewer. They're really it's it's they're a person just like you. Uh, be be yourself. Don't try to oversell yourself. Don't try to sound too confident, like in a in an arrogant way. But be confident in a you know be confident in your skills. This is what you have to offer. This is what you're bringing. Um, so not not being arrogant. Um, and uh, I would avo- avoid asking about the salary the first uh, the first interview. I mean that's something that will come up. Uh, in the conversation, it will come up. So you can also do your research. So go on Glassdoor, go on, um, yeah, go on Glassdoor and see what the average, you know, that's out in the open, glassdoor.com, look for a salary of a operations manager in X place. So you do your research and now you know, okay, well, with my experience, somebody that has X amount of experience in logistics, the average salary is this, great. That's what I'm going to be looking at. So you can apply to the, to the, the jobs and you know that you know, most companies are, are competitive. We want to stay competitive. We want to make sure it's a win-win situation for both parties. We don't want to give you a bad salary that doesn't fit within the range of what you what your expertise is. So, be um, not don't ask about compensation in your very first interview, um, and just make sure that you're doing your research. Ask the ask the um, the individual what what their ideal would, uh, candidate would be, what their expectations are, and what they enjoy the most about the job, because that's going to tell you a lot about the company. Because yeah. especially post-COVID, Anna, would you say, being in the business, that it's true that, I mean, you know, you probably have a lot of the knowledge, skills, abilities, or KSAs that they're looking for, mm-hmm. right? So what we're really interviewing for is I'm trying to determine if I'm a cultural fit with you and 4840, and you're trying to determine whether I'm a cultural fit because you're going to invest time, effort, and money in in helping me become an even greater asset to the cultural organization that's hiring me. So um, that's really what you're interviewing for. Like you said, the, the, the X's and O's, the salary, the position, the location, like A, you could do some of that research and at least get a ballpark without asking the manager, right? Uh, the other I think I think that you said is just absolutely amazing. I want to make sure the audience heard that is don't just say, hey, I was a logistics guy or gal and I set up four supply chains. And I did. You know what? Because any other logistics cat coming out of uniform would have done the same thing. What did you do with what you were tasked? How did you exceed expectations? Now I'm looking at an investment. Now I'm going to sink time, effort and money to you because when I give you something, I'm going to get something greater in return. And for us veterans, that's often hard because we're taught not to talk about ourselves. We talk about what our team did. And look, like Anna's saying, every single hiring manager out there knows that you didn't do anything on your resume all by your lonesome. There's no such thing anymore. We're globally connected uh, supply chains now, right? We know you did it through a team, but how were you the catalyst? How did you help the team achieve that success, right? So you gotta learn to talk about yourself and you heard her, but not braggadociously, right? Like, hey, Here's what I was assigned, like anybody else would have been, but here's what I did with it that nobody else would have done, and here's what that did for the company. You're just stating facts. You're not being arrogant about it, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I was writing down, so I mean, uh, completely scribbling as fast as I could because I thought there was a lot in there. Um, Pinpoint your your accomplishments. I love that. I think that's, uh, like Doc said, it. The position's important. What you did with that position is more important. So make sure the impact to the organization comes through. Um, Keywords from the description, right? No brainer, but people don't do it. What does that mean? That means, guys, you have to go out and write a resume for each position. You got to tweak it. Put the keywords in. Because when they're reading it, they got to know that you, that's step one of doing your homework. Did I read the position description that I'm even applying for? And how do I let them know? I put those words in my resume. (laughs) So it sounds silly. People don't do it. Um, And then skills you're good at, right? Highlight some of those skills that that you got trained on in the military. And you don't have to leave those out. We do leave them out because we're humble critters, but we we shouldn't because you're your first glance, you have to be able to pick up on those skills. So copy that down. And I will say, 
um, the, the don't do, don't BS. You didn't say it, but that's what it really, what, what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> don't bullshit the people across the table from you. Why? Because that pickup on everybody can smell it. So I thought that was, that was good, but be, be yourself. I mean, you don't want to work in an organization where they don't like the real you because in six months, all that faking is going to go away anyway. So you want to be somewhere where they accept you for who you are. Um, and it's a two-way thing. You know, it's a two-way street. We want to work in places that make us happy. Um, and we, you want to hire people that are happy to work for you. So it's, it's perfect. And then I think the, the biggest key point I also took away was return on investment. Every hiring decision is a risk for the hiring authority. If I hire the wrong person, I just lost money. Right. And a lot of it, I mean, it's not cheap to do this training. It's not cheap to get everybody set up. It's not cheap to have somebody sit across the table from you. They could be doing something else additive to the business. So there's a business value you better bring. And if that stuff's on your resume to help them reduce their fear or risk, that gets you into the interview room. I mean, I, I could just see that the, what you were saying was some of the words you weren't saying, but you were saying it. It's like, you better bring value that is equal to my time to bring you into this organization. So, wow, well said. And Anna, what, so, so speaking of, you know, the X's and O's and the questions they should know before they get there and whatever. Um, so we've had this conversation with a couple other hiring managers. Um, and I just want your take on it because of your breadth and depth of the industry that you're in. So when Let's say you hire a, a vet, right? Let's say you hire me and you realize, hey, he, so he did great in the interview, great cultural fit. He had good questions. We had good questions. It was a great interview. We put him through three or four interviews. He met whoever the top hiring manager was. So now he's on board. He's been in the job six, eight, 10 months. He's absolutely crushing every single thing we give him to do, right? He's leading when he needs to lead, managing the stuff that he or she needs to manage. So he's or she is following, showing that they're a team player, fitting in the culture. What do you guys do if you realize, gee whiz, we gave him a title that's three rungs below him, or we gave him a salary that's fifteen thousand dollars below him? Hmm. What should we do about that, if anything? What What do you guys do on the other side of the table if if you realize that 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 situation exists? So that's a great question. Um, we in 4840, I'm proud to say that we're a company that we are looking closely at the people who are doing the right thing. And it's it's easy to spot when you have a task and you complete it and you exceed, it's so easy. And you're like, wow, like this person really caught on to this or this person went above and beyond and you can see. So luckily in 4840, we pay attention to that. And we either promote the individual if we know that they can take on more responsibilities. I'm not going to have you in the same um, in the same position with more tasks, but I can train you for something more if you're ready for more. And if you show me that you're accomplishing your task and exceeding expectations, you're definitely ready for more. So we are. I'm proud to say that 4840 is an organization that can see that, and we like to develop our in, our, our team. We like to enable and empower our team to be able to to grow professionally as well. And because we're growing so much, the supply chain um, industry is growing and expanding like crazy because we are growing, we have so many opportunities. So I can't tell you how many promotion letters I write because we see individuals that are, that are, that are um, exceeding their expectations. And we know, you know what, you outgrew this role, but I don't, I'm, I'm not going to keep you here because what's going to happen. You're going to go find somewhere else where if you're bored here and you have these great skills, I want to, I'll give you if you're ready for a new step, we'll give you that new step because that'll benefit that'll benefit the company and that'll benefit you as a as an employee. So we I'm proud to say that 4840 has tons of room for growth. A lot of our newest regional, one of their newest regional directors started as a forklift operator. So we definitely are able to identify the the individuals that are doing the right things and give them, you know, and set them up for success. So we'd also rather promote someone internally because they know the industry, because they know the people, they know the trade. It's a lot easier to, um, to promote this person and to teach them the new, the new um, skills required or to, to teach them the new position rather than having somebody from within. And the worst thing that can happen is having the employees beneath the new manager teach the manager what's going on. That, that's one of my 
biggest pet peeves. You know, what's so amazing about that is sometimes veterans sit around and tell each other veterans and we perpetuate myths that are completely detrimental to each other's physical and professional health. For example, don't ever take an entry level lateral movement job. So either entry level A or lateral movement. And like you, Anna, I've talked to hundreds of hiring managers in dozens of industries. And now I can say I've talked to a hundred and first hiring manager in an industry I didn't even know existed. And she said the same thing. Look, when people that mean well tell you don't take an entry level job and or don't take a lateral movement, okay, do that if you want, but at your own professional peril. Because like Anna said, in Civ Div, it's all about time or money. There's no get mission done. There is no mission anymore. It's be profitable or don't be profitable. It's sell and recycle pallets or it's not, right? So if if the if the team that you're playing on sees that you're undertitled and or you're under challenged and or you're underpaid, they will make it right. They have people in the HR department watching that stuff because they know that some other organization could come along and throw more money at you and off you go. And now they've got to replace you, which is usually a third or two thirds of your salary. They've got to retrain somebody else. They've got, you know what I mean? You leave a vacuum on that team when you do that. And so it's, you, you just heard it from, you know, the gal telling you that this is her job to hire these people and promote you. So don't, you know, as long as you're, you're getting your basic needs met, you got to get industry experience. I mean, I couldn't walk in an interview well with Anna. I'm going to do my research and everything, but if I walked in and acted like I knew industry pallet management uh, industry, I would, you know what I mean? She'd be like, dude, quit with the BS, bro. She'd throw a yellow flag across the desk at me. Right. And I'm a pretty good BSer. But, you know, my, my point is, is that take the position with an open mind that I'm going to learn and you're a veteran and you'll out hustle everybody that she probably puts you on a team with and she's going to be watching and she's going to see it and everything will catch up. You'll get industry experience, you'll pay your title, everything will catch up and everybody's fat, dumb and happy running pallet plants, man. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I will say, I, just to point out what both Doc and Anna said, is show them that you're ready for promotion. Don't tell them you're ready for promotion. <laughs> Showing them by getting your work done faster, more efficient, and more effective, rather than, hey, uh, it's been a, a month, I'd like a promotion now, right? I mean, it's <laughs> show them that it's, and be patient, know that your hard work will pay off. But don't go in there and just like a bull in a china shop. I mean, we we do have some veterans, and it is a thing that sometimes they uh, they feel entitled. And I don't think that's you know necessarily veterans, but it's probably people in general. You feel entitled to a certain mental role. Go prove it, and it will balance itself out. So well done. Yeah, I like it. I like that you guys have a, a aggressive program for that because that does matter. What else? Yeah. What else? What else about forty eight forty? Could you tell us where do they get that name from? Forty eight forty is a standard measurement of a pallet. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's not a very known fact unless you're familiar with pallets. Uh, but forty eight forty is the standard. A standard pallet measures forty eight by four by forty. Wow. So, yeah, uh, forty eight by forty inches. <laughs> Okay. Um, I learned that not that long ago because I was like, oh, well, I wonder. And then when we were doing a plant tour, they were like, yeah, this pallet is 40 by 40. This one is 48 by 40, which is our standard one. I was like, there it is. That's it. <laughs> that was it. And uh, I mean, we have a, pli a private fleet of trailers. So whenever we provide our customers with solutions, we're not just relying on like third party um, individuals to get the job done. As far as the, the company, we uh, we, uh, we have a second brand, part of 4840 called Relogistics, um, that handles with all the total pallet management with the retail side, um, the on-site and off-site services. So that one stands for reverse logistics because we provide the reverse logistics um, services uh, to, to the clients. But there's, you know, there's so much in pallets. This industry is huge because everybody who needs to ship anything and distribute anything needs a pallet. If you go to Costco, if you like, if you go to Walmart, all those, all the, the warehouse is stacked up with pallets, stacked up with products. So it's such a growing industry. And I mean, I gotta, I gotta be proud to say that we are, we truly care about our people. We care, we believe that our people are 
what drives our organization. And of course, our customers are super important. Without our customers, we wouldn't be anything. But without our people, our people are the most important assets to our company. We, we see them as employees. And most of our employees are general labor employees. So we see our employees as people. You're not an employee. You're not a pawn. You're not an ID number. You are a person with a family, with goals, with challenges, with a life outside of here. So we want to make sure that each person is valued and taken care of, and they know that they're coming to an organization that cares about them, that understands that, hey, you have a life out of this, and and we want you to have your life. We want you to do that, but because we also want you to, uh, to be happy where you work. We spend more time at work than we do at home Monday through Friday, right? So might as well be somewhere that you actually enjoy. And in today's day and age, I think it is important for you know when when somebody when you're looking for a job you are looking at you know what you can do for the company but also what this company can do for you it's a it's a two-way street and we understand that and when it comes to um to military members a lot of people in our leadership team from um managers to um c-level executives we're from are from um, our, our, our military veterans. And it's so it's so interesting to work with them because everything is so structured and they're so disciplined and everything, you know, is is set in in a way where those skills that they learned in the military are transferred into the civilian life where the operation just is able to run smoothly. And they're, you know, we, we're, we're very thankful to all of the uh, military members, um, especially the ones in our, uh, in our company. And, you know, they're, they're some of our best employees. So we definitely encourage veterans to apply all the time because we have, we have a place and, and they'll learn so much with the skills that they already have. They will learn so much. They will, um, they'll be able to grow and learn into, into grow into positions, you know, farther than what they may be thought of. And I got to tell you, for those of you out there not watching, but you're listening, you should have seen her light up as she started answering that question. And even if you couldn't see her, I bet you could feel it. Anna, I'm in Florida. It's 89 <laughs> degrees outside already. And, you know, like it's not even June yet, right? It's summertime is here in Florida. And I got goosebumps from listening to you, sister. That was amazing. And so it's no doubt at all, gang. Hey, I wonder why Vets the PM places uh, military transitioning military members with 4840 in their skill bridge program. I mean, that right there is your answer, right? We don't have to worry about you. We place you over 4840 and sky's the limit, right? So, Anna, so, so awesome um, that you guys feel that way, that the corporate culture is that way. And your your personal passion, that was just, that's that's cool. I don't have any reservations at all about sending a brother or sister over there and saying hey go talk to anna tell them doc sent you tell them kathy sent you i mean <laughs> you're you know what i mean it's going to be great you're both of you are going to be wildly successful yeah for sure what are some of the, like if i was a veteran listening to this program one what's the best way for me to uh apply what what avenue what, which where should i go and then two, other than the skill bridge, right? Because they know where to go for the skill bridge. But for two, um, what are some locations? You talked about, you know, we've got 2000 um, future hiring. What are some of the hot locations that people, because that's kind of a big thing when you get out of the military, you've been told where to live. You kind of want to live where you want to live, right? So tell, just share a couple locations that you might have. Of course. So first, where to apply. Um, you can go to 4840.com. Uh, slash careers. So if you type in any city, we're in 38 states. So if you're in San Antonio, if you're in Fontana, California, if you're in Van Buren, Ohio, we have a spot. Um, oh. Or relogistics.com slash careers. So there, there two are, are two different brands. The 4840 brand handles um, the plants. So um, if you're interested in a assistant plant management position, plant management roles, or learning the uh, the plant operations, which is uh, building, repairing, and custom making pallets. Um, for the reverse logistics and the uh, total pallet management side, it would be on real logistics. Um, as far as location, so we operate in 38 states, really anywhere, um, West Coast, 
in the Southwest, in the Mid-Atlantic, Southeast, Northeast, um, Midwest, anywhere. Okay. I think the only locations where we don't, well, the only states is um, in um, North Dakota, South Dakota, which I'm sure we'll get there little by little. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I mean, our plants are, are all over the U.S. Yeah, I know. I won't make you try to come up with 38 of them. I, I mean, I'm thinking five, right? <laughs> yeah. 38. I mean, guys, you're going to have a opportunity to live where you want to live, you know, for the most part. So, wow. What a, what a really cool relationship. One that we get to uh, play with you guys, but then two, uh, did our transitioning veterans actually have a place to land almost anywhere and get into a completely different industry yet utilize all the things you're good at. So what, what a, that's a really cool marriage of talent meets opportunity meets location. So what any we doc, have, well, go ahead. We said we have room, we have room in human resources. We have room in, uh, in project management. We have room in operations anywhere. All we, you know, if, if you want to learn, if you want to, if you're down to get to work and just learn and start a career that you'll be successful, that you'll enjoy coming to work, this is the place. Wow. And it sounds like, you know, not only is it diverse in titles and diverse in pay scales and diverse and like <laughs> there's several different business lines. I mean, you could probably change roles there at uh, 4840 every 24 months. Right. And do another decade and a half or two decades of career and never say, hey, I did every gig and got a T-shirt from every role at 4840. I mean, so I, I don't know about a lot of other veterans, but if they're wired like me, type a that was just exacerbated by all the hua 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 i mean it you know hey man that's why i love project management about the time i get bored 18 24 months in oh look a brand new project great <laughs> you know so uh that for me that really speaks to me too and and i know quite a other few vets that you know the 6200 plus we've put into corporate america over the last seven years there's, there's more than a couple of us that have that same kind of I worked, once worked for an old colonel, and he said there's two types of folks. There's those that build castles, and there's those that sail ships, right? So what I love about Anna and 4840 is you might be a ship sailor and looking for the next horizon, but there's lots of different places you could go and still be in the same great company, the same great leadership, many of whom are veterans, she said, the same great culture, you know? I mean... I, how cool is that, right? Like you get to play for a winning team for decades and win multiple rings. I mean, boom, sign me up. Let's do autographs. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, as we wrap this up, and any um, parting shots for uh, the transitioning veteran, any tips of advice that you might give them as they start this job search with you guys um, to make sure that they're kind of getting the secret in? So the first thing that I, the first piece of advice that I would give them is know that you have so much to offer. So start already in the back of your head that should already, just because you don't have experience in a particular industry does not mean that you don't have experience because the skills that you have learned in the military are very hard to find for people who have been in management for 10 years. Just because you're a manager does not mean that you're a good manager or the, just because you're a manager does not mean that you're a good leader or a team player, right? That, that title does not necessarily give you the credentials. Um, but if you, if you are transitioning out of the military, we understand that it's not a piece of cake. We understand that it's a different, it's a difficult transition from the civilian life, but know that you already have a ton of skills that you can offer that are intangible, that you can, you know, don't be afraid to start from the bottom because you can learn so many skills and we call it, I'm sure you guys do too, earn your stripes. There's mm -hmm. gonna be some things you're gonna be earning your stripes and, and some things at first you might say, well, I don't, you know, I was a, I was a, in the supervisory role before and I'm not supervising anyone. Okay, well, maybe you're not supervising someone right now, but you will learn. If you learn the basics, then you can learn more. But it doesn't make sense to us to put you in a management position if you don't know the positions that are under that right? you got to make sure that as a leader, you know, everything around you, you have, you don't just go, you don't enter the military. And then all of a sudden you are, you know, in, in a high uh, position, you got to learn step by step. So don't be afraid or don't be discouraged of, of the fact that you have to start from 
from the bottom because you might have experience with the military, but in this particular industry or the industry that you choose to go into, you might not. So you got to learn, but it's fine because you learn and you will find those opportunities. I'm proud to say that I'm part of a company that will see those opportunities and will see the potential and will enable you to grow and to give you the right tools to move on to the next step. In some companies, that might not be the case. That might not be the case where they'll, you know, you'll, you're going to a position and you're going to be there for 10 years. You don't have to be there for 10 years, but then you can take those skills somewhere else. So always don't, don't be afraid to learn new skills. Don't be afraid to start from the bottom. Um, don't be afraid to say, if they ask you something in an interview, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay. And most importantly, when you're coming into a new, a new company and position, ask a lot of questions, ask as many questions as you, as you need to know, because when you're in a mission in the military, you need to know everything about what's going on. You need to ask everything because if not, that can cost you your life. In this case, it's not the same, but if you don't ask a question, you're, you know, you're not going to know. You're not dumb for asking a question. You're dumb for not for having a question, not asking it, <laughs> right? So don't be afraid to, to, to get hands on. Don't be afraid to learn the trade and um, don't be afraid to ask questions. There's so many things that military members and veterans have to offer that companies see because most people don't have them. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, I couldn't. That's a great response. Ask questions. Know that you have something to offer. And then when you get in there, you know, uh, it, it's, it's just be willing to set aside that, that leadership, at least for a little while, so you can learn. Everybody says have a 30, 60, 90 day plan. You shouldn't be making decisions in that first 30. You should be learning. <laughs> get to <Yeah>. know. <laughs> no, I, we, it, it's hard to put down. It's a hat that you sometimes get real comfortable with. Like you said, you know, I was a supervisor. I shouldn't be a supervisor. Well, you should have been a supervisor when you knew everything about the military role you were in, but you can't go supervise people on building pallets if you've never built one. Go build a few pallets first. They'll learn the best ways to build pallets, and then you can lead the people who are building the pallets. So uh, amazing. Doc, anything for the group? No, I mean, I would just say it right there. There's the super secret squirrel handshake. If you're sitting in an interview and you think, hey, I should be supervising this joint, and Anna says, oh, yeah, what's 4840? You know what I mean? Like, if you've built a pallet, you know that. If you've never built a pallet, you probably, or talked to Anna on a podcast somewhere, you probably don't know that, right? So, like, something that simple. So, even the, you know, uh, Jeremy, we do it every day. Even the founders. I mean, hey, man, I still teach. I still build courses. I still do all the stuff that we ask anybody at Vets of PM do, right? Still get on the website and knock around on the back end. Although Jeremy's partitioned most of it off, so I can't break the website anymore. But you know what I mean? Like, you don't necessarily have to do that task every day. But like Anna was saying, and Jeremy was saying, I mean, you, you got to know what your folks are doing. And you know that you did when you were in the military, you were the chief engineer or chief technician or chief, whatever. You hadn't been a technician in eight years, but you sure knew what the technicians could do, were supposed to do, should do like, you know, same thing. So I love it that, uh, that 4840 and, and uh, guys and gals like Anna are in that organization with the mindset they have and the culture they've created uh, to give you that, that headspace and time to get in there and figure out what's next and, and remake yourself, right? You probably have as much, as many years of gas left in the tank in your second profession as you did in your first. So what a great opportunity. Anna, thank you so much for coming on and telling us about it, teaching us 4840 and what a hoot, what a hoot. Thank you guys for having me. I love, I love talking about my company. So <laughs> it is, it's been a pleasure. And again, the military members, we are so thankful for putting your lives on the line every day for us and to, you know, and, and for this country. So we're so happy to, to have you guys on our team. Thank you for tuning in and spending a bit of time with us at the Military Transition Academy powered by Vets to PM. If we piqued your interest, but you want more details, please head over to the website vets to pmcom and see if we can help prepare you for a better tomorrow or a future meaningful and lucrative career.